Today is uh, January 11th, and uh, we set the alarm for 2.22, uh, the moment I was born in, in uh, 1944, so I'm now 69, which is Jehovah. It's also, uh, in Hebrew use, uh, 70, which is the book of Daniel, and uh, 360 days in a Hebrew year, and it's also the Mayan calendar. 360 days in a year. I wanted to make uh, a few comments. Uh, first off, those of you who are my age um, will find that as you get older, um, uh, certain things happen. For example, you might get uh, uh, little spots on your arms, called age spots, they're dark colour things. Now, notice that. Um, Yesterday, as I'm uh, the last day before I turned 69, I uh, started to look at some of these spots on my arms, and uh, there were well, possibly 30 small little dark spots forming and a couple of big ones. And uh, as I was uh, sitting there doing something else on my computer, I just reached over as a big one, and I started to scratch it, and it peeled off as if it was. Uh, been stuck on, and um, uh, last night uh, we set the alarm for 2:22, uh, or 2:20 actually, and wake up at 2:20. And um, the promise is, is everlasting life on the earth. This is what I've been trying to talk to you people about for years. And. Um, You've got to have the qualifications to be the Christ. You have to have, first off, the royal blood. You've got to be the most royal person. You've got to be able to explain all things. Um, and of course, as we know that the... <laughs> this one in China. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, how you doing? Good, mate. How are you? <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was just saying that uh, we set the alarm for um, 2.20 in the morning and I'd noticed uh, yesterday, as you get to my age, you get little dark spots of the normal ageing process and uh, over your arms and uh, I, I, I noticed that they started to come loose. And I had a, one that was about a quarter inch across in my right arm. So I started picking at that and next thing it just peeled off. Well, these things don't peel off, right? Now, once you get that, it's pigmentation. So this is sort of raised up uh, and uh, formed this little crusty bit and then just come off. So um, as I'm laying in bed this morning, um, I've had a uh, very sore neck for 66 years because my father, he used to have a hobby of beating me with his... He'd punch me in the head on the uh, left side of my head. And that affected my neck. Um, as would you imagine being a uh, boxer and you get someone at your own size belting you in the head every day. Well, can you imagine a three-year-old child being beat by a man that's uh, nearly six foot tall and a, a wharf labourer at that and pretty tough? And uh, he was just a sadistic bastard. He left, his hobby was beating the shit out of me every chance he got. And it was funny, my mother used to say to him, don't punch him in the head, Reggie. <laughs> like a three-year-old kid, right? So uh, he kept that up until I was about 12 and I got too big for him. One day I smacked him and, and that's it. And uh, he never did it from then on. But he, he'd become a cruel man in other ways as well. He was a very, 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 very bad man. Anyhow, uh, I woke up and I noticed that my neck didn't hurt anymore. So that's something that I was really... Because you can't do nothing about it, you know, it's just the... Uh, the uh, tendons and the muscles have all been damaged from this. I mean, it happened every day, two or three, four times a day sometimes. Uh, until, uh, let's just say, about 12 years of age. And bad neck all the way through. But now it's gone, which is uh, rather extraordinary. So the whole point being is that if, if I can't reach a point in time where the ageing process should uh, be cease and then start to roll back the other way, that's the promise of everlasting life, isn't it? So uh, I thought, well, hey. 
So uh, that's what that basically happened. So things are looking up. Happy days, yeah. <laughs> and how's things going for you? Yeah. Yeah. Good health. You know, the little pay the bill, you know, right now it's been tight, but, uh, you know, we're doing okay. Good. Get fine. Well, we've been noticing the, uh, looking at the weather satellite in Australia, uh, there's so many bushfires and it's getting so hot that they've had to add another colour to the um, uh, satellite images in purple. So it's gone from red, which is up to 50 degrees Celsius, which is about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's going over that. So it's getting, oh. getting to be, you know, the, the record temperatures is, uh, is amazing. And of course, we've moved up to Queensland, which is normally very, very hot. And uh, this is not where it's happening. It's happening down the southern part of the uh, of Australia and into central Australia. And uh, that's because of the uh, shift of the uh, Coriolis effect. It's all weather oriented. And of course, they're also working on this Blee Harp thing. They've got that going like crazy over here and uh, to control the weather. But uh, so we're sitting in a nice, nice area and it's nice. We've got a nice air conditioner and everything's lovely. But go down here, get down from here a couple of hundred miles, you start to get bushfires and very, very hot. Hey, is that the same area that got all the flooding? Yep. Uh, about a year ago? Yep. And there's flooding down there now, too, I believe, in some areas. Yeah. Just like what we have, we got off of a year's worth of rain in one day about two years ago, and then a year later, if we had the worst, you know, high temperatures we'd ever seen. Right. So the same thing over there. They're doing the same thing with Hark over there that they did over here. They yeah. put all the clouds out, they press them out so you can't develop any cold temperatures. That's right. So, I, mean, I can tell when they're doing it. I, I'm sensitive to it. I can see the lines in the clouds that are not normal, the concentric uh, space lines. You can tell when they're pressuring it up and when they're lowering it. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, it's pretty wild. I'm just ready for it to be over. I don't know when it's going to be over. I'm sure ready for it, though. So. Well, in around the year 2000, um, I was uh, in a factory which a guy was setting up a big printing business and uh, the guy I was, uh, my nephew was talking to the young fellow out the front and I was just wandering around looking at these lovely machines at the back and I mean they're worth a fortune these things and they could put a uh, perfect photographic image on the side of a building by using a three meter wide piece of vinyl and as high as you like so that's the kind of technology they brought in from Germany and this guy um, he was a physicist that had uh, been employed in America at one of the uh, nuclear plants and he got exposed to radiation but because uh, you know you're dealing with American companies they just uh, pushed him aside and um, he ends up coming back to Australia but because he had top US security they gave him a job at Pine Gap so um, this guy's the same age as me but he looked 95 years of age and uh, he said yeah this is what they've done to me so he said I shouldn't be telling you this, but he said, oh, I haven't got much long, longer to live. And I said, oh, yeah, what's that? And he said, well, in Pine Gap, the, uh, when America took it over, they bought this farmland for 50-odd cents per acre and pushed this guy out, who was very shitty about it because uh, he'd lost his thousands and thousands of acres for this peasley amount of money. And um, he said, what they did, they drilled down eight kilometres and put an aerial antenna down into this thing and he said what they can do is uh, and what it's all about is causing the um, continent to become a uh, like a woofer speaker yeah, the giant speaker. Right. yeah and he said underneath this is 500 miles from the uh, the uh, what's called the, uh, the gap if you like uh, which is great Australian bite and uh, he said underneath that is uh, a connection to the sea and it's all water and he said Australia is like in that area is like a giant plate turned upside down so you've got this raised up area about I mean the highest part is about 500 metres which is not that high we drove through it and I took all the GPS readings and all that kind of thing so it's about five to six hundred metres tops and he said but what they do is they put up the slow frequency and this thing's bouncing back and forth causing the Australian continent to be a bloody uh, giant speaker and that is key to uh, what they've got going with HARP all around the world, which is 
the one in Alaska, that's one thing, but they've got, I think, 36 different locations, and they've even got ships with this harp technology on board, which they drive around anywhere they like all over the world, and uh, they can then triangulate that. Right. Well, they have the, they have the chemtrails, they have those in the sky, so that they have the material, so they can bounce these things off of that material. Yeah, you're dead right. So, uh, you got to have something. That's right. So, he said to me that he got a job there, and uh, he, he found that this is what they were doing. So uh, that's an extraordinary thing. Now, um, Australia had had an 18-year drought, which is against all physics and laws of uh, nature. Uh, it's usually, if you get a drought, it could go seven years, like the old seven. biblical right. stuff, you know, the seven-year drought, then you, uh, this goes back to Egypt and all that kind of stuff, where the Joseph went over there and he was the king or the, the governor and Joseph, and his brothers come over during the drought. And uh, they had no provisions for Israel, and old Jacob has sent his sons over that tried to kill his, his uh, younger brother, and he got sold into captivity, became the governor of uh, Egypt, and then this is the story of Egypt, uh, Joseph, and all that kind of stuff. So, point being, they're recording in those times a seven year drought. Yep. Now, we're hitting 18 year drought. Now, why is that? Well, first off, uh, the farmers, the highest suicide rate in Australia was the farmers. Because that that mortgage the farm, they might have been there for 100 years uh, with their family, and then uh, suddenly they go seven years of the drought, so the bank lends them some money, and then the next year it's going to be great. It's going to the drought will break. Never been this long. So 18 bloody years later, uh, right. the, the banks have taken over all the farmland. This is what basically is happening. And throwing Monsanto into the deal. Oh yeah, and throwing Monsanto into the deal, and uh, with oh, yeah. that yeah, with that kind of seed and stuff. Yeah, so it was uh, very interesting to uh, to be in part of that because I just happened to be at the right place, right time to see this guy, and he told me. So about a week later, now imagine uh, uh, your factory, uh, let's say, oh, on 150 feet wide, 200 feet deep, big factory, full of these bloody beautiful machines, right? And uh, all been set up brand new. And he was going to go for this and, and uh, make some money before he died for his family. So um, I go back a week, week and a half later and it's not only is the sign on the front of the factory gone, a big glass front factory, that every machine in it has disappeared. So I got to ask myself, did it really happen? Did I just go in there, angels do this sort of stuff, it really gives you the horrors, and I spoke to these people and then when I go back again, everything is gone. So either it was angelic or the government's gone there and cleaned him out because he spilled the beans about, because they can hear everything I say, because everything's bugged, right? And they know, they know I'd be there, the phones are bugged, and of course I carry mobile phones. So. so I thought, well, that's probably what's happened, that they've gone in and cleaned him out. And just, he just disappeared. Well, that's the kind of things they get up to. Yeah, if that's something they control, then I can certainly see them doing that. Well, yeah, well, look at your James Bond movies. That's nothing compared to the reality. You know, I, I actually knew a fellow that worked... He was the uh, man who worked for the mail services uh, and handled Obama's mail. And that's the guy that come out to stay with us for half a year. And turned out, the, night, the first night he got there, I was just talking to him about, like, we're talking about half, and all of a sudden, just did a 180... I said, you're a uh, FBI agent sent out to spy on me. And he said, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, you're talking about Jeremy. Jeremy. Right, he says, yeah. Now, on his bloody computer, to get into his computer, I had to use it one day for him. He was away. We needed something in his computer, so he rang me to find it. And I said, oh, we'll need a password. And I was bloody agent. <laughs> right. How dumb is that? Right. So anyhow, right. uh, yeah, this is what it's all about. So... They, they sent this guy out to, uh, to spy on me, of course, and um, his buddy was the uh, son of an American admiral and uh, was a paid assassin. Now, I spoke to this guy on the phone through Skype, and uh, he was telling me that uh, he got out of it because um, the uh, military was telling him to kill people that he said had no military basis for that. It was just maybe a political person or something else, or something out later. And he said, oh, bugger this, I'm not going to do this no more. So he had a string of people that he'd killed, 
But uh, he just said he ain't going to do it no more. <clears throat> I said, well, how come they didn't kill you? Because you don't quit that sort of stuff. And he said, well, it's because my father is one of the highest admirals in the American Navy. That kept him alive. So this is the kind of thing that goes on. You talk about that people down, down the street in the local bloody beer parlour or something, and they say, you're nuts. But no, this happens. This is what they do. This is what they do. Oh, okay. So it's all interesting stuff. So anyhow, we've reached the uh, this date now where there should be a should if you keep your eyes open, <coughs> you'll probably see a slow change in uh, what's happening in the world. Now I was told yesterday, uh, Joel, did you hear about that uh, guy who's Obama placed in charge of the uh, army now, and he hates Israel? No, that's interesting. Yeah, well, Ash told me. Secretary of Defense, Hagel. What's Hagel? That's him. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, not happy with Israel at all, and uh, thinks America shouldn't have nothing to do with these bastards. And because uh, Israel is getting worse and worse, so from their perspective, they're going down the drain, right? Yeah. The problem is he's also put in a new guy that actually uh, was the one that pushed the drone program. This other guy that he's got put in charge of the CIA. Because I don't know. That's probably actually not even his part. So what do you think is the front there? Uh, well, yeah, for the CIA force, and that, that guy's probably dirty as shit. The one for Hazel, uh, for the Secretary of Defense, I think that's probably a good point. He does not want to go to war with Iran. That's, you know, he's got his head up to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, see, the Americans are starting to wake up, I think, as well. So. You know, you have people like Alex Jones, I think he's on the slide now. I, the first time I seen him, I thought, well, he's a he's a uh, spooker, right? So it's a long time ago, and I've been telling people Alex Jones is an asshole. Don't you worry about that. He's part of it. Oh, yeah. his, his wife's a Jew, and he's got dual nationality, <laughs> right? So in in uh, in the world of Zionism, if you're a Jew, you're loyal to Israel. Doesn't matter whether you're an American, Australian, or whatever. Your loyalty is to Israel, your religion, right? Which is a dual nationality with a religion and state. Yeah, with the religion as an excuse, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. So it's all very interesting. Uh, what's cooking with Gabriel? Eh? What's cooking with Gabriel? How's that thing coming along? Oh, well, uh, you see, I, I don't know whether you've seen the last video we did on the uh, Hawaiian telescope, Canada-France telescope. Uh -huh. Now, I've just been checking that out again with the old records and... Uh, I've got Stellarium, I've got uh, Home Planet, um, I've got Starry Night, and uh, I've got an old Easy Cosmos, so some are connected to the internet and some aren't. And uh, we can do comparisons where the moon location is. Now, what happened on the uh, 6th running through to the 7th, 2.36 in the morning, there's this gigantic uh, flash of orange light, which is the same that happened on Ash's birthday last year. Uh, so that's on that video. But you had a hard time trying to get it to stop on the spot. That's the one. That's the one. Huh? Now that indicates that it's going past the uh, uh, earth very close to the earth because of the speed of it. So if it flashes past the earth and it's that large and that close and then the same light is then reflecting back on the moon and the moon is a new moon so it shouldn't have any light reflection at all. And here it is, as bright as a, a small sun, which is because the light source has now moved past the equator towards Australia and uh, reflecting back and not blocked by the Earth. And it's reflecting back on the moon, so it bounces off the entire moon back to the Hawaiian telescope. Right. The brown dwarf? No, I wouldn't think so. Uh, it's, it's probably... Um, uh, if it was a brown dwarf, it would be a lot larger, and I think it is coming, but uh, the Adam in, in uh, Poland and, and some other people are telling us that uh, they've seen it quite often, and um, they say, oh, it's on the other side of the sun, it's glowing, so therefore they're saying it's on the other side of the sun because the sun is reflecting off it, and therefore, but no, it's on this side of the sun, it's much closer, and it is glowing itself, it's got its own light source. And that's what accounts for all this kind of strange stuff that's been happening in uh, in uh, the South Pole and 
all that kind of thing that we've been watching for you now. So, uh, yeah, they're all very, very close. <coughs> and I don't think they're going to have much uh, uh, possibility of stopping the world seeing it within the next very, very short period of time. So that, that'll change things around. And uh, I think the world's waking up to the Jews and uh, what they've been up to because they, uh, they are of the devil and they are trying to kill us all. It's as simple as that. But the Christian mind, of course, uh, doesn't like to believe all that kind of thing, love each other and turn the other cheek and all this bullshit, something I never said. And um, I said, yeah, love each other, providing they're good, and fuck the Jews, because they're of the devil, right? That's why, if you read John 8.44, it's saying, you are of your father the devil. Well, there's no way the devil can remain on the earth in human form, because if Jesus comes in human form, God's in human form, Therefore, the devil's in human form because it's the spirit of the devil that's in these people. That's what it's all about. Right. So they better get their finger out and uh, start realizing that uh, the angels sort them out. You got two witnesses, two angels, and they come along and say, "Right, you're out of here." And the next thing, you're gone. Yeah, you said you got one that's a witness and one that's the egg. That's about it. Yeah. So everything I've done in the last two months or so. Um, has been destroyer. Now, the destroying angel, of course, is Gabriel. Why? Well, Gabriel is the angel of God. Michael is the angel of Jesus. So there's your two angels, right? So you've got God coming to the earth as Jesus and then coming back again. Well, those two angels now are witness of the past and witness of carrying out the, the death sentence to the, those who are going to uh, continue trying to do what they're doing. It's the end. And we've also crossed the Milky Way galaxy equator, so we're in the northern side now, so that's it. Okay. Yeah. Apart from that, apart from that, it's been a bit quiet. <laughs> <laughs> when are we going to be out of the basement of, of, uh, of the building? Uh, look, I, I would give it six months tops. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just accelerating exponentially, you see. So I, I don't think we'll go much, much further. But I, I'm not, I don't care, really. I mean, I uh, have been telling the bloody uh, Israelis and I've been telling the Americans and the Australian government and bloody, uh, you name it, in particular Iran and the Arab nations, that uh, you can either go along with it or you can get crushed by it. You, you're going to please yourself, but there's not going to be anything other than what I'm saying is going to happen. Right. It's all there. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's also, this date today ends the uh, Pyramid Prophecy. Now, the Pyramid Prophecy is based on lunations. Matter of fact, I'll probably do an up upload about it. Uh, the lunations are 1114. So, if you look at your any astronomy program and see what lunation it is, well, the January the 11th now is uh, the 1114th lunation. And that is the... Uh, up to the um, uh, capstone of the Great Pyramid. Now the Great Pyramid, how you measure that, you've got all your internal chambers and uh, they measure and lay within a height of 1114 pyramid inches and each pyramid inch represents a lunation. And that's cross-referenced to the uh, layers of masonry outside the pyramid which ends at 202 layers and then you've got your missing capstone, right? So that's, yeah. that's the stone the builders rejected. There's another prophecy for you. Psalms 1, 1, 8, 22 and Matthew 24, 21, 22. So, um, no, 40, 42, 21. So anyhow, um, what that it all means is that we can't go any further. The, the pyramid is the altar to the Lord because that is the height of it up to, its, right. uh, up to the uh, capstone is the actual height of the land mass of the earth and uh, it's also the value of Isaiah 19, 19, 19, 20 which is you in Hebrew that adds up to the height of the pyramid. Right. So, um, what I've been thinking about doing and I was just going to start it as you ring was talking about uh, people like uh, uh, David Berlinski. He's a sceptic mathematician that uh, uh, he has said that the uh, evolutionary thing, which is kicked off by uh, Dawkins, 
around 2006 and he's selling books like crazy. So it's supported by the uh, Jewish control of the, uh, the book printing industry. Oh yeah, they, they dominate that totally. They dominate that. So if you can buy a book and on bestseller list, well he's, he was on the bestseller list and suddenly, uh, because he's a Jew, suddenly he's not, so they say, that he can't have any more reprints of the, the book. So therefore it was a bestseller and suddenly the Jews in New York are not going to print anymore. Well, that seems very odd, but to me I'd say it's a trap. Um, what they're well, saying, what yeah, it's all it's all bullshit. It's all manoeuvred. It's all, all all chess moves. So he's on about the uh, gap theory and evolution, of course, and not saying it took three or four billion years to happen. What he's saying is there's gaps in it, which doesn't have any uh, conclusive evidence to suggest that it's a continuous thing with a fossil record and all this kind of stuff. You see, so he cleverly did say a few things that would give the uh, anti-evolutionist hope that uh, someone is finally making sense and he was interviewed with uh, Stephen Meyer who was a man and uh, another guy called Michael Behe uh, and uh, what they're talking about is um, the intelligent design well you can't learn about intelligent design in any ch in any uh, uh, university, no. university because it's uh, anti well, so yeah. they want to do away with God right that's the whole point oh, yeah. so if they admit there's a God then they say oh shit okay then we've got a, a Jesus problem so um, because the yeah. Christians all want that however that's all manipulated too so what I was just saying to Joel this morning that this Berlinsky um, he talks about the Holocaust because his parents they survived the Holocaust but his grandfather died in it so I said wait a minute Anyone who spends four years or five years in the Berlin, uh, rather the uh, German concentration camps, if I was Hitler and I wanted to kill them all, they would walk in the door, they'd be shot and buried. Right? No problem. But no, they've got to continue with the, the myth because they bullshitted Germany into paying uh, compensation oh, yeah. to every, not only are they paying it to the people that were in the bloody camps, but to their descendants. Right. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah. here's this, this uh, guy who's a very smart man, and uh, he's saying things that would support the uh, idea of creation, but uh, he's just debunking the uh, evolutionary point, not actually saying there's a god. But what he does say that the Holocaust was real. So if he's so bloody smart, why would he be saying the Holocaust is real? Well, that's his part. That's the other side of the of the coin. His job is to. Yeah, that's how they work it. They work both sides, right? So it's like the Alex Jones thing, right? Right. Well, yeah. hey, I've got a, I've got a son here, Stuart. He wants to say hi to you. Oh, yeah. Right. How old is he? He just has his 10th birthday. Hold on. Ah. Hold on. See you on the same Hello, Stuart. Happy birthday a little while ago. What date was you born on, mate? Good date. 2002, eh? Uh, what, do, you, do you talk about this kind of thing at school with your mates there at school? Okay. Do you, do you talk about uh, what your dad is talking about at school with all your friends? Oh, yeah, some of them are really funny. Right. <laughs> Lots of fun, eh? Yeah, so uh, that's good. Ten-year-old, that's a good age to be. Got your whole life ahead of you. Yeah. Have you got any brothers or sisters? Oh uh, no, I'm not a child. All oh, right. Okay, that's that's good. All right, we'll put your dad back on. Okay. Okay. You have a good one. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm I, back. The phone is breaking up a bit. He couldn't quite hear me. I, I just said to him, does he speak about this kind of thing at school that you're talking about? Does he talk about uh, what we're talking about at school with his friends? Oh, oh, I don't know that he has. He's not really understanding what I'm talking about. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> it's yeah. a bit hard for a ten-year-old, isn't it? He knows who you are. He knows who you are. So he got question that bit. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's great. Anyhow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I better let you go. It cost you a fortune, huh? So I better let you go. This is costing you a fortune, isn't it? No, only about four cents a minute. 
Hey, that's not bad, is it? No, it's cheap. It's cheap. Yeah, my top one's cheap. If I use my landline, it's costing me four cents. But no, my top one's cheap. Oh, wow. Well. Big deal. Oh, yeah. No, well, when we, when uh, Adam and Claudia was living with us uh, and Claudia went back to Poland, Adam's sneaking in, he's using the phone, right? Next thing, I got an $1,100 phone bill. Oh, shit. Yeah. So, uh, like, I wasn't happy with Adam at all. He was in the, on the verge of getting chucked out on the street. Just for the deception of it is enough. But he, uh, uh, he learned his lesson. But I told the uh, phone company, stuff it in your ass, I'm not paying it. So, um, a little while later, like, they're, they're bugging my phone, right? Like, they're listening to every word I'm saying now. So uh, I said, you stick your phone in your ass, I don't want it. Well, next time we get a phone call from uh, one of the managers and uh, yes and uh, blah, blah, blah. But uh, well, the phone call was made to Poland or several phone calls were made to Poland from your phone. I said, I don't, don't care. <clears throat> I ain't paying it, disconnect it. Yeah. So next thing we get uh, a day or so later, we get another phone call, uh, we have wiped the bill. <laughs> to keep the phone line going, right? Yeah. So, this is the kind of crap we've got to put up with, but anyhow, that's how it is. Oh, Not for much longer, man. Maybe you have Adam try it on his uh, cell phone. For some reason, if you use cellular phones versus landline, the cell phones have better, better uh, cheaper programming. I don't know why, but they're a hell of a lot cheaper. Yeah, well, what happened was uh, what well, you discovered on the internet somewhere where you can buy. <clears throat> the uh, the time on the phone, and uh, we've been ringing Poland. We get you know for a dollar, you talk for an hour. Oh wow! No, oh, it's, it's unreal. Oh. It is awesome, yeah. So you know, for, for so we've been talking every day to Adam because Adam's having all sorts of dramas going on in Poland. Yeah. And uh, he's been having dreams and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. We want to hear about it and record it because when we you get the phone call, we put on, well, we put on speaker and then record it, right? So it's all, all history. Yeah, I told a prosecutor or a close guy about a friend of mine that had a, a dream about the uh, uh, giant orb swirling around and he was flying with them and uh, with the angel. It was, it was pretty wild. It was a very vivid dream. I sent uh, one of those messages to Asher probably about three weeks ago, you guys. All right. Yeah, I'll ask her about it. Wow. She probably did mention it to me, but she handled all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was right after you guys, it was right after you did the Three Days of Darkness. All right. He started explaining the position. My friend, he, I didn't even ask him about it. What are you talking about it? He said, hey, I had a strange dream the other night. I said, really? Tell me what happened. And he told me that. I was like, wow, that's exactly what you're, it's the threat that's coming. I said, this is exactly what's coming. Yeah, well, uh, if you might recall, on December the 6th, uh, Joel got out, it was uh, one in the morning, and he noticed that here's a, a, yeah, here's a quarter moon, uh, bright red. Well, that can't happen. It's got to be a full moon, and it's got to be in the shadow of the Earth to do away with the blue spectrum, and that's why it turns red, the light turns red. It can't happen, can't happen with a half full moon. Yep. So... So this is this is the kind of strange thing that happened on the uh, the other day. This last upload we did on about Hawaii uh, that can't happen there too because it's, uh, it was only about a uh, twenty percent, twenty four percent or something light on the moon, and yet the this thing that goes flashing past uh, it's got to be very close to the Earth and to move that fast across the, uh, the sky um, and. Um, this is what uh, is actually happening all around the world because where that came from, of course, is from the northern hemisphere. So people see it up there. But do they ever get on the internet and get allow allowed to talk about it? Because as soon as I upload something, usually uh, they, they stop it. So uh, it's like this Nibiru uh, thing. Yeah, isn't that a camera out there in Hawaii? It just takes clicks every two minutes or is it every? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, they're all time delay. But uh, what it's done, it, we take a, a, a shot of it, and then the next frame it's gone. So if it's two minutes, it's gone across the, whatever the time is, I should look it up, but whatever it is, it's huge speed that this thing has gone. And then uh, we see all this uh, 
reflection on the moon that can only occur when it's in direct light from this thing, whatever the light source is. Well, have you started looking at the new Mars station again, or is there anything to look at now? Um, like look, I, I haven't. Um, uh, I've been waiting for other people to do that. Um, I mean, I've, I've put up 400 odd videos about Nibiru, and what happens is um, uh, you put my name in Nibiru, you get nothing. Right. Because you were in this hollow net, right? So they just cover it all up. So that is why we went to uh, getting other one other uploads to other people who will then upload it, and that gives it a, a bit of time to be on the air, and then before they knock it all off. Yeah. So as new people come in, they upload it and carry on. So anyhow, it's, as I say, it's uh, all just indicating. I mean, it's so stupid these people to do that. Um, that um, they know who I am, and so therefore they uh, are packing the shits big time. <laughs> Yeah, but there's this one I did. I, did you notice the one I did on the magnetic motor over unity uh, gravity motor? Oh, well, yeah. see, you don't even need that. Uh, you, what you've got to do is control the price of oil. If you own the oil, you're going to run your car for next to nothing, like I did in Libya, 14 cents a gallon. Well, that's, that's nothing. Right. Peanuts, right? But then they say, oh, yeah. it gives off all the gas. Well, the bloody plants love it. They're saying, oh, it, 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 it causes this, it causes that, the world's heating up, that's bullshit. We've, uh, right. All the planets are heating up because across the Milky Way galaxy equator, that's number one. Number two, that uh, you put CO2 into the air, or if you had a room and you've got plants in there and you filled it with CO2, they thrive. Love they love it. Oh, yeah. And it's... You need to teach that in junior high that the photosynthesis, you have to have CO2. Exactly. Simple. That's right. All right, so the, the big thing now, if I can sort of, well, I have put it out there, but if they get onto it, which we will do in the kingdom, and that is to use compressed air, and you put it into your piston at the top dead centre uh, with your fuel as a diesel, for example, at 20 psi, it immediately fires when you put, push the uh, fuel in at the same time as the air. And uh, you don't have to have a compression stroke. If you don't have a compression stroke, that means you've got uh, virtually, each time the piston comes up, it becomes, going back down, a compression, a uh, fire stroke. So normally a four-stroke engine, right? It's a work off compression. Isn't that what makes it fire? Yeah, but you don't need it no more. If you're putting air... See, how it, how it works is you take a blower that runs off the exhaust and they put in as high a pressure as they can. It could be 18 pounds per square inch. Okay, so that comes into the cylinder and then you compress it. So as you're compressing and you're building up to 18 pounds per square inch at the top dead centre. And then you squirt the uh, fuel in and the compression of the air is so hot that it will cause it to cause the fuel to fire. Now, if you do the same thing with an air supply at top dead centre from a compressor, which they're using on the French cars that they're using air, get two or three hundred kilometres out of a, uh, a tank of air, then what you ha what's happening is that you're doing away with the compression stroke because the air is already, already compressed. So you push it in and you also spark it. You'd have to spark it. And then that would then take that air, which is going from a cold air at 20 pounds per square inch. It's not compressed, so it hasn't heated up. So it's 20 pounds per square inch, and then you fire it, it then expands it and pushes down the air, and the air will then give you your stroke. You can do that with every stroke. So it goes up, fires down, goes up, fires down. So what have you done? You turned a four stroke into a two stroke. Okay, you basically reverse the whole process, it kind of sounds like a reverse of what we typically do. Well, just no one's thought of it, that's all. That's yeah. the only reason I'm not doing it, I haven't thought of it. Now, there is another alternative. If someone has sort of it, it probably kill them. Because that would mean that you're, straight away, you could turn your diesel engines into firing on a downstroke just by altering the camshaft. It's not a problem. So, this is how you could do it. Yeah, you change the position of the, of the system and when you're going to put the air in. So, okay. That's right. So, you're compressing nothing, that takes power. To compress the air, it takes power. So, this way, all it's doing is exhausting the the uh, fuel, spent fuel and air, to the top, close the valve, 
squirt the 20 PSI in, ignite it with your fuel mixture, and you may have to use a spark plug or even in a diesel, I don't know. This is for the engineers to work up, but it's not a big deal. And then you've got a power stroke straight down. Next thing you come back up, you push the air out, the spent fuel, and close the valves at the top, put in 20 PSI, and bang, down you go again. So it's probably in the neighborhood of 400% efficient, over 100% if you, if you say an engine for a one, one strike up, one strike down, blah, 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 do your four okay. strokes. Well, it's gonna be 400 times, I would say, because number one, you're not compressing anything. Number two, you've got double the power stroke. So it could be could be three to four hundred percent. Wow! Now that means uh, I had diesel trucks in Canada. I know how much money I spent on fuel. We get to a point where if we own the oil companies, then uh, eighty percent of your cost of manufacturing everything is caused by the uh, cost of fuel. Right? Some of the people over there deal with guys and I know the fuel costs. Oh yeah, I deal with that every day. Have the hear about that. So yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough way to make a living right now in the freight business. Oh, absolutely. Now the, uh, I do. <laughs> as the uh, fuel itself, um, the reason they are causing the uh, problems in the Middle East, they want to control all the oil. <clears throat> and originally when they set up Saudi Arabia, um, the gross national debt of America, 2% for every um, dollar they spent given to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia gave 2% to the Jews to pay off the national debt of the printing money for nothing out of the system right. that, that uh, now dominates the world. So... This is your, this is your main deal where you got to eat nothing you have to buy your oil in dollars. I mean, that's what's been supporting the dollar the whole time. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So then you get Libya come along, they're in gold, stupid yeah. move. And then uh, you got uh, Saddam Hussein, he went to the Euro, stupid move. That's why they went after him. Yep. They went after him, they finished him off, no problem. Yeah. And, uh, he said he was going to do the, the, the dinar, the golden dinar. That's right. That's after him. That's the end of him. Well, these people aren't too bright. That's the whole point. They haven't got... And they've got a proxy war with Iran, trying to go through Syria, but luckily Russia stepped in really recently. Yeah, that's right. Well, see, I've been talking to Russia and I've been talking to Iran. And uh, this is what you've got to do. Now, I don't care whether you do it or not in that sense. If you're that stupid not to take the advice and you don't know who I am by now, there's nothing fucking wrong with you. <laughs> right? Well, you think every one of the ships, they touch the ground, so... That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, uh, uh, elephants are very hard to move unless you've got something to tempt them with. Well, as far as these countries are concerned, they're tied up with their economic system, the war machine, the politics, the... The people that's involved, they've got their high priests and their, their uh, different people that are advising them. They're all dominated by the devil, otherwise they wouldn't be in that position. Yeah, the snake strangling them. The snake, yeah. That's right. You know, so uh, what should have happened under a logical world, if we were living in a logical world, as soon as I come on the scene many, many years ago, they should have sent their people out to interview me. Say, well, are you him or are you full of shit? So what's it take? A couple of scholars to come out from Iran, from, from Iraq, from the United States, from England, who, whoever, say, hey, okay, we're Muslims, but maybe we're wrong. Well, of course you're fucking wrong. Right? If I can prove who I am, I'm saying you're fucking wrong. That's it. The reason you've got a problem is not listening to the word, see? So I've always gone on that. Why? And that's why I abuse and say fuck and do all this kind of thing to piss everybody off. And they say, oh, Jesus wouldn't say fuck. They wouldn't he? Fuck you then. You know, that's how I think. Oh, bloody hell, that's right. I mean, I've, I've said to people that, that sometimes come in here that, oh, Jesus wouldn't swear. Oh, fuck you. I can swear and so do like you can't. I make the rules, right? Because if I'm God in the flesh, I make the rules. Yeah. All right. And what does fuck mean anyhow? Fornication under consent of the king. Blame that on, on Charles I. Right. Hmm? That's what it means. It's an acronym. Oh, yeah. F-U-C-K. Sure. Exactly. Hmm? And a cunt is a knot in a tree. You know that? <laughs> That's one of my favourite words. I don't use that much, but I mean, it is. An, all these good sounding words take on the devil 
because of the way people use it. But and that's what it means. A cunt is, a, is actually a knot in a tree. Not yeah. exactly. oh, the tree. Yeah. I've called a few people a silly knot in a tree, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, like, it's like simple words like the word remember. That's right. Yeah. You need to understand what words really mean. That's right. So, it's amazing what's in front of us and we can't even see it. Yeah. But anyhow, as I say, I don't give a damn one way or the other. I just do what I do. I'm not going to change because it's got to fit into some man's idea of stupidity. Uh, I am what I am. I just say what I say and that's it. If you haven't got the sense to work out who I am and why I can do these things and not get killed, after all, I've been abusing everyone on the nation and in governments. And uh, uh, the assassins have tried seven times now. So um, is that a is that a pain stop for the uh, that injection they gave you, that spinal and stuff? That yeah, that should that should have killed me. Um, but of course, uh, the the uh, agony over that lasted many years. But uh, also, when they took the the disc out of my back, they took the wrong one out, and they, they oh, shit. yeah. So that was twenty years went past or whatever, twenty five years until the original disc blew out and was granulated like uh, lumps of, uh, of salt. Wow. So maybe an eighth of an inch or smaller pieces. And that was floating up and down my spine, resting on all the nerves. And, uh, of course, I had that uh, die on my back. That didn't kill me either. Will your body start regenerating that stuff? Is it going to stop? Oh, well, it's it's been it's been dispersed now. I don't have any pain in my back no more. Or uh, um, I suppose when they did the X-rays, they it may have changed since then. But back in 1990 or 91, 92, era, when I uh, had another operation, um, they did an X-ray of my eyes because it put me through an MRI, and an MRI is uh, thirty thousand times the magnetic field of the Earth. So the idea is if you've been grinding and you've got a bit of uh, metal in your eye, it can pull it through into your brain. So they do what is called an x-ray of your orbs. And the guy who did it, he said, oh, you've had a myelogram lately, have you? I said, no, 25 years ago. And he said, well, I told him about the dye. And he said, oh, shit, that stuff is banned in 1984 because of what it does. And then I'm starting to think, oh, all right, they're trying to get me again with that. So uh, he said that the the dye had gone up into my brain and optic nerves and so forth. And uh, just taking an X-ray of my brain, you can see that it had been dispersed through the whole nervous system. So it didn't remain in my back. This is the whole point. It went up the spine into the brain and eventually made its way into the op optic nerves. Well, that had a good, good effect in the sense that um, uh, the Workers' Compensation Board in Canada had to pay me off and uh, give me a lump payment and also a, uh, uh, a pension for 99 years at the time. So then they changed it for a pension for life. So in other words, they didn't expect me to live 99 years anyhow, but they changed it because of other people. They might just simply put a pension for life. So when you die, that's it. It gets cut off. You're not going to die. Well, that's the whole point. But <laughs> <laughs> keep, on, keep on sending me the check. <laughs> yeah, 99 would have been it, but it didn't cheap. Now they're yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so all these all these lovely things they've done to me over the years. Cyanide was a good one. They tried to kill me with that. Yeah. And uh, they've, they've tried bullets. They've tried uh, watering a, a steep uh, road. They put me onto this road. This is how in, in depth they go. Now they sprayed it down. With they water. sprayed it down with water, oh. and I come over the top, and man, I just took off right. That's right. Well, it, the ice was so slick it stalled the engine because I had a jake brake on, see? And that, uh, that, and that just uh, caused the engine to stall because the wheels locked up and that was it. So then I had to knock it out of gear, start the engine again, get it back into gear and this, by this time I'm doing 60 miles an hour. Yeah. And the only chance I had, I, I just seen uh, the uh, lights of the truck come around the corner, which I thought was, was actually my truck, another truck that I owned. And this idiot that was, I mean, talk about morons, this guy, this, this guy takes the cake. Instead of telling me that he had slid down this hill before me, 
Uh, he was chatting to uh, someone on his CB radio, which like an idiot I had bought for the truck. He was chatting to some guy down in Texas. Right? So he's not on the, on the bush radio. Yeah. So I just hit the ice and I'm gone, right? So straight off the edge and into a stand of trees. The tree was about, where I hit it, was about two feet, two and a half feet thick at the top of the tree. So the tree was a pretty big tree. So I, I hit it at about, oh, I don't know how far up, where it was, it was on the side of the mountain, I guess. But it, it might have been 30 or 40 feet up the tree where I hit it and uh, on the other side of a ravine, which was 185 feet. The truck ended up 185 feet down off the road. So it totally smashed and destroyed. And uh, next thing I'm in the white light and I'm gone. And uh, tell me who I am, remind me. Oh shit, no one can do this except you. You're Jesus, sorry. <laughs> Got to go back down. I thought, oh shit, that's the last place I wanted to go to, right? But uh, next thing, angels are carrying me and placed me on this truck that had been suspended up at road level. And... Um, Oddly, the truck was at 90 degrees to where it actually come off the road. So where it ended up, it had done a right angle into the bottom of this ravine. So here I'm sat on the top of this thing, the, the, the roof of the car, truck's gone, and uh, it starts to then slowly descend into this uh, ravine. And I'm thinking, well, going to be an impact coming up now, not realising the truck had already hit and been brought back up. It had already been destroyed. So there's a time factor here of time warp, if you like. And um, when I hit the ground, it was permafrost, and uh, there was no no impact at all. And just a sudden going from, you might say, from the descent realm, and then when it was on the ice, it then accelerated, and then I come to a stop. So it might have sped up to 20 miles per hour, and then slid to a stop. Now, it hit the ground so hard it bent the frame of this Kenworth and the engine came out. Eh? Hey? The truck, you were sitting on, the truck, you did the 20 miles an hour and it came to a stop. The truck you were standing on and sitting on was completely destroyed though, right? That's right, already destroyed. You were sitting on top of it. We're sitting on top of it, yeah. No, no roof. That's how it's fucking your head. <laughs> you can't <gonna> reckon. <laughs> so, this is where I get off the truck and I step off and of course the, the fuel tank is on the ground. The front axle's gone. The engine has come down through the frame. It's a Kenworth. Yeah. So it's a Cummins diesel. Well, no, no, I, I never get... Nothing frightens me. This is the whole point. I just sort of take it in stride. And uh, yeah. I, I, I checked to see if the balls were still attached. I thought, yeah, they're still there. That's the main thing. And I stepped off this truck onto the uh, permafrost. And to my amazement, Although the truck is totally destroyed, the lights are still on. Like it can't happen, right? Oh. Yep, headlights. So I walked around the front of it and uh, I felt a, something moist on my forehead running down my face and it turned out to be blood. And it was a sliver of glass about three quarters of an inch long off the mirror. Because the mirror is not safety glass, right? And uh, I pulled it out and I looked at it and I said, no, I'll be damned, thorn of Jesus. That's what I thought. And I flicked it away. I should have kept it. Matter of fact, it's probably still there. Oh yeah, well, I, see, I wasn't into measuring things in those days. Uh, number one, I didn't have any of the, the tools we've got today, you know, astronomy, GPS, and all that kind of stuff. It was only years later that I could uh, work it out. And of course, the stars above all said Christ and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, oh yeah, right, great. So it's not. It's like it really, and it's the same as if it would happen to you. From that, men, from your mentality, uh, and happened to you, you look at it and think, what the hell is going on? You've just been told, you're God, that you've got to come back and do it. And you've got all the evidence in the world, there's, there's a pile of bloody rubble there that, that there's no possible way you could survive it. And also, we didn't have seatbelts in those days. And uh, you're wandering around and looking at this, this wreck. And of course, if you're a practical-minded person, you know it's impossible to come down that distance to hit the ground with such force. And if, if the roof is already gone, when it hit the ground with such force, they would catapult you bloody 500 feet in the bloody air or out into the bush, right? So it would kill you for certainty. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, you could fly to the hundred people. It, it is spreading with the body of the shred. That's right. Oh. That's right. So anyhow, uh, I did have a photograph of it, but my ex-wife has got that. And I haven't asked her about it because she's an arsehole. 
and uh, we'll just wait and uh, eventually I'll get hold of that photograph and it'll, it'll show the position of the road and I took some photographs of the truck hauling it out and uh, etc. So, uh, wow. Yeah, well, I was right, I tell you. So, you know, like, who do you go to about this? You talk to a psychiatrist, they immediately give an injection and lock you up. So i just got to keep it to myself as just one more miracle I have experienced in my lifetime now, the miracles that happened ever since I was a baby boy. Well, man, it's amazing. Yeah, well, it's amazing. so it's a mature soul in a little boy and I'm at the same soul in the man that I was at the time, 30 odd years old, and um, the same soul today. The only difference is that I can connect it all today with the equipment. Yeah. I put the dots together and I don't give a fuck who believes it or not. Look, it's, I, I read the stars, I do your birth, time you contact me and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, you've got to be somebody. So uh, we just put it all together and uh, that's what it reveals. Now, does it mean it is actually 100% certainty? Well, I'd say so. Everything else seems to be uh, the case. So what the hell? You know, I mean, it's really up for you to accept it. If you didn't accept it, it didn't matter to me. I just got to keep on doing what I'm doing. I mean, people come my way because of who they are. Right. Right? Yeah, there's a reason why we show up. Now, because I met you two days before, I called you two days before there was a giant cross in the sky on June 26, 2010. I found you on the 24th of June on the internet. Okay. I was looking like a madman for six months. I didn't know what the hell I was looking for, but I knew I was looking for something. And then, how did you feel when you found it? What did you think? When I first found Well, when you, when you comprehended what it was all about, or what was your first thoughts when you, on the 24th, and then on the 26th, the big cross. Now, uh, this is another a milestone because the five planets at that time that formed the cross in space was uh, a total of 66.66 uh, astronomical units. Right. And you said that was the only time that would ever happen, I believe. That's right. Can't happen again. Yeah. And so I, I knew it was just weird. It's like when I found it, I was like, wait a second. And I, and I saw the field, he was claiming the, uh, the throne. And he kept talking and he started doing these measurements. I said, hell, that's the only damn way he's going to prove it to me is by making the measurements and then we can cross references and strong support. So I said, he just decoded it. He just cracked the whole freaking code. That's it. And so, uh, so I, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm amazed how people don't get it. Yeah, well. Oh. I was like, yeah, first I, I, I didn't understand, or, okay, what all is he doing here? But then I realized he just converted the numbers to measurements to words. Well, then, then it made sense. Yeah, well, it, uh, you see, um, what I did event, uh, uh, originally, I thought, now, it has to be a code in this. So, um, uh, as I've been told uh, who I was, I was told as a baby boy that I was Jesus by Mary, and then... Uh, that we are Essenes and all this kind of stuff. And then you start reading the Old Testament and they're talking about this you can eat and can't eat. This is a, you can eat this fowl, you can eat this bloody thing over here. So wait a minute, Essenes are vegetarians. That's got nothing to do with me. Oh, yeah, because when I was looking, you know, when I was Christian, you know, and, 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 and so what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for the truth. Said, well, that's easy, isn't it? All you got to do is reverse everything you've been told. Yeah, but I didn't have to realize the truth was a man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. For the truth. And, and so, but I knew, I knew that you were in the scene. I don't know why, but when I read books years ago, I mean, let's talk, you know, 20 years ago, I was like, I had, you know, I was like, you've got to be in the scene. Yeah. Be. And that's what I believe. And then when we're talking about all this stuff, said, that's all this stuff starting to fall into line about. When you look at my library, I've got the Nile of Amadi library, I've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, I've got the, uh, uh, the other Bible. Well, you don't have to believe it, you just become, even if you did, doesn't matter because you've just become familiar with what it's all about. Bullshit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it leads you down this path because you think you're you know, gaining some wisdom, but it's deception. Oh, it sort of is, yeah. The rabbit hole, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I, I use the women that I was with. Uh, I've been with four women, if you like, in a marital situation. Right. And uh, although I didn't marry, I didn't marry Michelle, but we lived together for thirteen point 
uh, three one years or one three years, and um, the date that we um, separated, um, and I, I, I do it this way: I get them to throw me out, not me walk out. That's important. Yeah, right. Because otherwise, yeah, otherwise it wouldn't be. Yeah, I understand. You gotta, you gotta use their their own soul to um, uh, promote you to go in a certain direction. And uh, they like me find a I didn't find a cue. I'd get the way around. That's right. That's right. So uh, the date that this happened was when these stars were lining up, forming the five planets lining up, forming a cross. On that date, the 26th of what was it, June? Mm -hmm. Yep, 26th of June, 2010. It's the same day I started my channel for you. Really? Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> now, what does what does your wife think about all this? She's like, okay, cool. Well, she's, she's, she's cool. Because I believe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's great, isn't it? I mean, to, to be locked in with a woman that uh, is. Uh, on the same uh, spiritual level, and can see the logic of these things, and then you've got a little boy out of it. <clears throat> My problem was that I I had children too, but they all hate my guts because the mother is the biggest influence on the child. So my, when my mother died, it was on my auntie's birthday, my niece's birthday, and uh, my nephew's birthday. That's how it works in our family, right? Like, watch out for birthdays, so someone's going to drop dead. So uh, I had another auntie die on my birthday, for example, and uh, my father, his brother died on his birthday and all this kind of stuff. So uh, at, the, um, at the funeral, uh, I had a dear old auntie, Auntie Edna, and uh, she was close to me as a kid. And uh, I hadn't seen her for years, and uh, she was in her 80s. And I went and sat down and said, how you doing, auntie? I haven't seen you for a long time. Give her a big kiss and a hug and that. And she apologised for being so ugly. So she thought you looked ugly, Rob. You just old, right? And uh, I said, hey, you're my bloody favourite aunt. I said, how, how, would you, how could I ever think of you as, as being anything but beautiful? All right? Yeah. So we got talking there for a while, and she said, you know, I never did believe what they've been saying about you. And this is when I first found out about this, this uh, evil of the first wife. Uh, I said, I, and I didn't ask her what had she had been told. I didn't want to know. Yeah. And uh, Eileen, the uh, first wife, here she is walking around. And if you met her, she's, you'd say, what a lovely woman. She would suck up to you like crazy. So anyhow, she's splitting around all my relatives. And uh, they all love her, you see. And of course, all the other relatives, they're all ignoring me. And I think, what's going on? So my auntie said to me, I didn't believe for a minute what Eileen was saying about you. So I thought, aha. Uh -huh. Now, Eileen, the first wife, she had threatened me years before that she would turn my entire family against me. Yeah. And I said, well, give it your best shot. I don't care. Because that, all it does is separates the good ones, the sheep from the bloody uh, goats, right? So I only had one sheep, and that was Marnie Edna, that was telling me I didn't believe one second that you would be able to do what she said you'd done. Now, what had I done? I don't know. I still don't know. And uh, I don't want to know. So they're all going to be dead anyhow. That so doesn't matter. Right. It is what it is. It is what it is. So give it your best shot, Satan. I don't care. I'll I'll beat you anyhow. <clears throat> so it is a one man battle against the entire world that's had two thousand years to set this up. Yeah, exactly. That's what it's all about. So I say, right, no problem. <laughs> we'll, we'll just keep on treading water, and I'll just keep on. Showing that uh, by my nature, if anyone has watched me, especially on YouTube, they would see that what the type of person I am, right? It's not a something that you could hide. Uh, I'm just blurting out stuff that I see, and then that's the truth there. And catch me in a lie if you can, because you won't. Oh yeah, I've been watching you for two years. For yeah. Two years. I mean. Hell, I, I know you better than you know me. I, that's really not fair. I get to watch you guys. <laughs> and I, you know, I know what you do. That's your point, isn't it? Your mannerisms and everything. But you know, a whole lot about me. I mean, I'll seriously help you out when I get to meet you face to face. I'll be glad of that. Yeah. Okay. So, well, uh, hopefully it won't be too long. That's good. Yeah. I'm good. I'm tired
Yeah. So one day we'll have a big ship, as I said before, we'll sail around and bring everybody on board. I was saying to a, a friend of ours um, who, who phoned the other day, and um, two of these, two of our saints are getting together over communicating back and forth on Skype and, and listening to what we say and so forth. And they they got together, and they haven't actually met yet. And I was thinking about coming out to Australia, and, I, and uh, when this fellow phoned me, I, I said, "Well, you're better off." Uh, I wasn't phoning, it was actually Scott. I said, you're better off uh, helping this lady come down and see you, see if you get it off. Most important thing, you've got to be on the same spiritual level. If you're not on the same spiritual level, you're not going to make it. So uh, now they're thinking about coming out to Australia just for a holiday and then um, stay as long as they like. And probably by the time they get out here and it all... Uh, they settle in for a little while to have a holiday, maybe two of the country, whatever. Um, it'll all be over. It's not going to last much longer. Good. Um, anyhow, whatever it is, it's all preordained. We can't do much about it. As I've always said that uh, with my life and ob observing it, that uh, I don't get to make any uh, real choices of uh, what I do and on a daily, daily basis. I've often said, and I said Joel this morning, that... I doubt whether I even get to choose how many pieces of shit paper I use. Everything's preordained. <laughs> yeah, right. I think, I think you're, you're doing pretty well, but... You think so, yeah. Yeah, I was going to follow. I was going to play out. It's all going to play out. So maybe everyone else has a bit of a choice, but certainly I don't. Oh, yeah. You know it. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful, though. Okay. Yeah. Well, Thank you, my boy. Uh, what's your boy's name again? Stuart. Stuart. Love it. Yeah, S yeah, S T E W A R C. That's uh, actually a last name that came from a, uh, my uh, great grandmother. And then it was my middle name, and then I made Stuart's first name. Well, see, the Stuarts descend from the Marshalls. Yeah, that's what I was gathering from your uh, from your genealogy. I was like, that Stuart's the royal part of the royal line. So yeah, that's so right. Now. There's three ways of spelling Stuart, and uh, there's the English way, there's a the French way, and I think there's some other bastardized way. But uh, of course, Mary Queen of Scots was a Stuart, and she married a Stuart, second cousin or first cousin, and out of which uh, came um, her son, which was uh, Stuart, uh, yeah. and uh, she was forced to abdicate when he was just a baby, and he was raised by Freemasons, and. Um, she had inherited, uh, by marrying the King of France, she was uh, only married to him for about eight days and he died. So, she inherited France. So that's why it became the United Kingdom and that's why it's called the Union Jack. So, the Jack name was Jacob or James in English. So they spoke French in the noble noble world in the royal families in those days who spoke French and uh, the, uh, the whole point is that when they put the flags of France, England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland together you end up with all these one laid on top of the other onto the Jesus flag which is the white on a red background I think it was and uh, as it all turned out they changed the red to blue because blue means war Okay. It means war? It means war. So the blue on a flag means war. Oh, I thought blue meant fidelity. Well, maybe it does to some, but in the uh, uh, flag, it means war. That's why in the skull and bones in uh, uh, Yale, on the wall, it's oh. got war chiseled into the bloody wall. Because they get oh. things done by war. England has always done it. The one that makes the wars wins the wars. That's the whole idea, because you start the war when it's convenient to you, not the other way around. Right. And uh, this is what they've done. So it became a union of Jacques. Now that's what his mother, Mary, used to call him, Jacques. What, James? Jacques. So it's the union, Jack. Another way of saying it in French is Jack. Union Jack. Okay. So maybe we can try and find that on the internet, but that, I don't think you will. Uh, there's a knot. Uh -huh. mm. All right. 
Uh, well, thanks for the best wishes and good talking to you. Okay. All and, right. Uh, well, have a great day. I uh, will. Okay. Okay. Love you. See you later, mate. Well, I might have better upload than what I was going to do. He's a good bloke, isn't he?